Thank you very much, Tracy, for the invite. I'm really excited to be with all of you all around all around the world right now. Um, I'm going to try to talk slowly. I have, a ten I have a tendency to talk fast when I get excited or interested in something. So I'm kind of going to make a mental or a verbal note to myself. Let's keep it slow. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about research I've done over the last four or five years on the identification of predatory publishers. And I... Don't, I, I alone don't have any super fancy methods, but I'm going to show how some really simple methods, how just doing a lot of hard work with data can often reveal things that are both very interesting and sometimes they point to predatory publishing or something suspicious going on with research or something that requires further investigation. And I'm going to kind of tell my story and also mention some new developments in this general field that involve these general principles. I mean, sometimes it's an ingenious method to catch a questionable article, a questionable publisher, and sometimes it's just a matter of noticing something anomalous or something very simple that ends up being a sign of something really problematic. So um, I'm going to talk about my own experiences doing this sort of research and then mention some of the stuff that I think is really cool or really, really important in this general area of study. So to start off, um, predatory publishing is kind of a new phenomenon um, since we went over, or since knowledge became digitized, open access publishing is becoming more popular. I think in general, that's a good thing, but a kind of unfortunate consequence of this has been the rise of predatory publishing, where people are paying per article to publish, and that gives some unscrupulous publishers this perverse incentive let's try to publish as much as possible because we get paid for every single article we publish. We don't get paid for rejections. So the concept is generally co complex and controversial. Um, there have been many lawsuits launched over somebody calling somebody else predatory um, in this very litigious world we live in. Um, there's a lot of different um, definitions of predatory publishing, um, but they generally have kind of a similar inspiration or general general concept that it's when for-profit publishers, they publish academic articles with, with an adequate quality control or value added. Um, basically the notion, and once again, quality control is expensive, wrangling reviewers, doing proper copy editing, getting your article metadata in good shape, all of that costs money. Um, and a lot of these predatory publishers target naive and in some cases complicit scholars who want or need an easy publication, they want an open access publication, and they'll do it for money. And so some, it's interesting doing this research, looking at these questionable publishers, these questionable journals, sometimes you see a pretty wide variety of quality in the work you, work you see in these predatory journals or these questionable journals. You can have a pretty good looking article next to something that's complete gibberish. That's completely bad. Um, I'll tell you in the course of doing research in predatory publishing, we were looking at different nations and I thought this was hilarious. Um, the Vatican Vatican City had a public predatory publication. Um, both Vatican City is small and you just kind of expect Vatican City to completely play by the rules. As it turns out, um, that one publication was a really good paper, what looked to me to be a really good paper on the history of science by a visiting scholar. I think it was from Notre Dame University uh, in South Bend, a Catholic institution. But in that journal, that really fine paper by the Vatican City or written out of the Vatican City was next to complete garbage. So um, regardless, there's inadequate quality, quality control. If an article is decent in there, it's a naive author who did all the work themselves. And in my own previous work, I kind of argued that predatory publishing is a spectrum and that you have some really, really awful, egregious, almost comically bad predatory publishers. And then you have publishers that are kind of borderline people. Some people think they're okay. Some people think they're questionable. And then you have just about everything in, in between. And there's different types of predation, different types of unprofessional behavior by publishers. Um, and so not all predators are exactly the same. And in some cases, there's great disagreement on what is and what isn't predatory publishing. So I'll give you kind of an example of the very egregious, very obvious predatory publishing. Um, you have, I love dogs, but um, yeah, this dog should not be on the editorial board of medical journals. Um, 
And then here's another predatory journal or almost certainly predatory journal. Um, we, we ended up studying Austin publishers in our, our project. And I'm sure some of you might be able to see the problems with this particular um, journal webpage. You have Homer Simpson on the psychiatry website with a tiny brain. Um, it's comical, but it does not really bode well for this journal being professional. And I'm pretty sure this website's still up there. It's been up for years. I mean, this publisher who charges, I guess the equivalent of 15 to 2,100 euro, or sorry, 2,000 euro for a single publication, they have Homer Simpson on their psychiatry website. And once again, I, I love the Simpsons, but not particularly professional or appropriate. Now here's kind of a bit, bit more of a serious situation. Um, you have the publisher Omics that some of you may have heard of. It's probably the biggest and most infamous predatory publisher. It's based out of Hyderabad, India, and it's been extremely successful, extremely lucrative. And perhaps as a, as a consequence of that success, the Federal Trade Commission in the United States went after Omics and they took them to court. Um, they used discovery rights in court to get all, um, get records of peer review of Omics. And as it turns out, this rather large publisher, they looked at the peer review they were supposedly doing for articles. And for the most part, there was no peer review. Um, Omics was advertising peer review on their websites. They were pretending that their articles were peer reviewed. But in reality, using discovery rights, they had emails, they had electronic records from Omics. Um, they found that all Omics did was somebody put a number one in an Excel spreadsheet saying, yes, we peer reviewed this. And so for the vast majority of articles in this publisher, they were not peer reviewing their articles, even though they were saying they were. Um, United States federal courts fined Omics $50 million um, and then it was held up on appeal. Um, Omix is, is not operating in the United States, um, so I'm not exactly sure how the U.S. is going to enforce this $50 million fine. But having said that, um, this is one case where Omix, you can feel relatively safe calling a predatory publisher and that multiple judges in the United States have said this publisher is not good or their business practices are unethical. And we have concrete proof that they claim to do peer review, but we know for the most part they do not. And so this is one example where a predatory publisher got sufficiently big and successful that somebody invested the resources to really go after them and find out what's going on. Now, Omix is hardly the only predatory publisher that does this kind of stuff, but they're kind of the first and most prominent case where somebody formally went after them and exposed exactly how these predators work. Because generally, and this is true of all illegitimate um, shall we say, law-breaking or rule-breaking organizations, they tend to prefer to work kind of in silence or in secrecy. Um, and so this is one case where we were able to find out exactly what was going on. So in general, you know, peer review is often, it's often, you know, confidential. And most academic journals, it's difficult to see exactly what they're doing. Um, Omix, of course, being the exception where you had the Federal Trade Commission use discovery rights in a large court case to do some serious research on how they work. But for the most part, especially these predatory publishers that often just emerge out of nowhere, as I'll talk about, they rebrand, um, they kind of come and go, and they're hard to monitor. So regardless of what publisher you're looking at, you generally don't get to directly observe what they're doing. And in some cases with better publishers, a lot of like university presses, you can kind of trust them for the most part, but other publishers, you just don't really know what they're doing. Okay, so this is strange. Okay, so there we go. Predatory job, as I mentioned, predatory journals, they tend to operate in covert or deceptive manners. They don't want people to know exactly how they work or they wanna put out a deceptive image of how they work. And then on top of that, studying predatory journals and publishers is challenging because they aren't indexed by the web of science. They aren't in Scopus. So there isn't really metadata and it makes analyzing these journals difficult because there isn't systematic data kept on them. Um, so what we try to do in our research is collect document data, metadata about questionable journals that aren't necessarily indexed 
so we can learn about who's publishing there, perhaps learn more about how they're operating. So we used a variety of web scraping techniques and we targeted a variety of journals, but we were sure to include numerous publishers on the Cavill's, I think they call it the predatory reports list. Now, this is Cavill's is a third party. They've been in the publishing industry for decades and they collect their own list of publishers that they think are, are questionable. Um, I don't think it's infallible, but that's in part why we chose it because we can investigate this further. Um, and then, so in about, in the very, very near future, we're going to open up the data we found on this variety of journals, including a num number of questionable publishers um, to open up metadata about journals and publishers that otherwise you can't necessarily analyze using Scopus or Web of Science data. So this will be coming out, we hope in the next three or four months when our research finally gets published. So I'll show you, and I'd love to tell you a story about how I use great methodological techniques or great genius to figure out, to identify malfeasance or ad identify problems. But I was just simply cleaning data during the pandemic. I was, there was a lockdown in Quebec. There was literally a curfew. I was literally not allowed out of my apartment. And I just spent hours and hours cleaning data um, as we scraped the data for all these publishers, especially because some of them are less than professional. It required a lot of data cleaning. So I'm going through millions of Excel lines and rows. And out of nowhere, I just, out of the corner of the, my, my eye, I noticed a really odd phrase, um, University of Canadian Province in the address of one of the articles. Now, it would be like um, in Germany, you have a University of German province. Um, it just does our German state. It just does not make sense. And I could clearly, as a Canadian, tell this is based out of Saskatchewan or Saskatoon. So it was clearly the University of Saskatchewan. And I was just baffled. Why in this address are they calling it the University of Canadian province? Um, so this is one line out of millions that just happened to catch my eye while I was cleaning data. So I look a little bit closer and what I ended up finding is omics, the aforementioned predatory publisher that got nailed by the Federal Trade Commission. Um, they're stealing and rewriting articles from legitimate Elsevier journals. And in this case, you have like the Elsevier legitimate article out of Bone Reports um, and then omics stole the article they rewrote it badly and published it in their own journal called the Journal of Bone Research and Reports. And if you look at the, if you look at the affiliations here, you see, you know, there's kind of bad grammar, U.S. of America, um, and then you have like the names of people that get changed. In this case, this woman Nancy Pleshko got renamed Urban Center Pleshko. Plushko, the Plushka, because of the B superscript, also got included. Um, and you see some really, in other omics articles, you see things like people named John get renamed Parliamentarian, um, like Parliamentarian Smith or something. You get some really, really weird names. And then on top of that, um, place names get gets bangled, like get screwed up, like North Carolina gets called Old, Old North State. Um, I will guess Nancy Plushko got renamed, Nancy got called Urban Center because Nancy is a city in France. Um, but regardless, this ended up getting weirder and weirder. So is this a matter of poor artificial intelligence? Is this a matter of unskilled staff doing who knows what? Um, but if you go through these omics articles, you end up seeing a lot of really bizarre names for people and a lot of really bizarre affiliations, city names, country names. And so this metadata out in omics in particular, and you'll, you'll see omics has a lot of subsidiaries, a lot of sub brands that, um, especially after the fifty dollar fine, fifty million dollar fine from the Federal Trade Commission, omics is trying to kind of conceal its identity, so it spun off a bunch of extra brands. You see a lot of this just weirdness in the metadata, um, and so. Here's another omics based journal, and you see in, like these weird titles, um, changes in colorful exhaled breath parameters. I will guess this is, has something to do with coughing, um, and I'm sure this is stolen or at least modified from some other legitimate article. And I guess if you can't tell, what's happening is that omics takes text from elsewhere, or at least 
in these cases, you have text taken from elsewhere and then run through some sort of a program, a synonym generator, uh, to rewrite the article using similar words, but then it ends up making very little sense. Um, I, if anybody knows what colorful exhaled breath is, I'd love to hear it. Um, and then it gets even funnier and weirder. So here we have, um, I'm looking at the text of this colorful exhaled bre um, breath article. And this is actually quite a widespread um, problem in omics articles. Um, I'm sure most or all of you are familiar with the notion of the standard deviation. Many scientific articles in the social sciences too, they report standard deviations. Um, and as a result in omics articles, because um, the acronym SD is used as short for standard deviation, um, some, some of you not in North America might not be familiar, but the SD is also the abbreviation for the United States state of South Dakota. Um, so what the synonym generator for this article program or whatever they use at omics, it, it takes SD and then replaces it with not South Dakota, but its nickname, the Mount Rushmore state after the famous mountain with the faces of the presidents in them. So it's hilarious, you know, you have mean values plus minus Mount Rushmore state. It is comical, but you read through the articles and you see a lot of really, really weird writing. You can see above Mount Rushmore state, you see the word exploitation, data distribution was assessed exploitation, the Shapiro Wilk check. I will guess exploitation is a synonym for used or via or a word that makes sense in this context. But once again, you have articles that were probably published elsewhere run through some sort of a program where they throw synonyms in there, but then these synonyms end up making very little sense. Another trick they use, I think Omics, this article is not this clever, is to take an article, translate it into another language, be it German or Farsi or Spanish or whatever, and then translate it, translate it back in English. So I might even be using Microsoft Word and you alter the text just enough, but as a result, you know, it's imperfect and you have some often very awkward and weird text, but okay, this is kind of, once again, a very big red flag if you're referring to the R Mount Rushmore state or South Dakota in lieu of a standard deviation. This is a sign this is not a very good or professional article. And plus it's clear that the publisher and the journal in question did not do meaningful peer review or meaningful quality check on this. So what's going on here? And Omics, once again, this is among the worst of the worst predatory publishers. And so they stole at least nine articles out of this. And this is once again, just because I happen to notice a weird affiliation in my giant Excel spreadsheet. Um, in some cases, Omics steals the article and then backdates it nine months or to, to a year to make it look like their article came first. Um, in some cases, and I've had to make some emails to authors, it's like, hey, did you know your article got stolen and you, you got renamed Urban Center or Parliamentarian? And these authors are sometimes amused and sometimes they're pretty angry. Um, but regardless, it's stealing of intellectual property. A lot of the text gets rewritten. It's rewritten very poorly, but perhaps it's a way to evade detection. But once again, what does Omics get out of this? They're stealing articles, but they aren't really getting any APCs or revenue out of this. And what I think they're doing, this is my hypothesis, is they're gonna fill journals with articles from seemingly legitimate art articles, often in the global North. You see like University of Pennsylvania in that article, another, another University of Saskatchewan case. So they're trying to seat these journals with Western high status authors to attract APC paying customers later. I think that's what they're doing here. And also Omics, also has a very lucrative predatory conference business. And um, I don't have time to go into that. There is um, a great story, I think it was in the Vancouver Sun in Canada, where somebody put on this phony conference and you know, it was held in the basement of a crappy hotel in Vancouver. And the, the people who went there, who paid their money and legitimately wanted a good conference ended up chasing the one organizer who was there out of the out of the hotel and it turned into they were running around Vancouver. Um, so I also want to emphasize once again that a lot of the people who end up patronizing these predatory publishers, they're often well-meaning 
and doing so out of naivety. So once again, just like predatory publishing is a continuum. So are the authors, so are the conference attendees. You have a lot of people who are not completely naive, well-meaning. You have people who are completely in on it. And then you have people kind of in the middle, like, yeah, I might have a few concerns or suspicions, but I, I didn't know. So that's just worth thinking about. And this is omics. Um, once again, the worst of the worst or among the worst of the worst. Um, so yeah, is it an isolated incident or something widespread? And this is once again, a, when you find problems with publishers and let's face it, no publisher is perfect. You just have to ask yourself, well, is this a feature or is it a bug when something goes wrong? And I'd argue in omics, it's absolutely a feature when you have weird texts in South Dakota, other places, you know, even the best publishers make the odd mistake. But once again, what's a feature? What's a bug? Now we're going to go on to another more infamous, very recent case. I, I think this is a case where a picture is worth a thousand words. Now this is uh, the very controversial publisher frontiers, which is, I argue, is kind of in a gray area. Some people think it's okay. Some people don't like it. Some people think it's very sketchy. Um, but it's very successful. It's grown quite a bit, um, but it's much better than omics in theory. But just recently they published this article, including this lovely diagram, which was clearly created by AI. Um, it actually was peer reviewed, believe it or not. And one of the peer reviewers who was at Northwestern University, he just said, well, it's not my job to, to police, you know, phony images. They did cite whatever the AI program is that created this monstrosity. But um, regardless, I mean, the, and you can look look up this article for more gory details, but um, yeah, the, this an image like this should have never been published at all. And so once again, with Frontiers, which is undoubtedly more professional than the worst predatory publishers, and some people don't think it's predatory at all, but how did this get through? Was this a feature? Is this a bug? And I don't know exactly. I mean, we don't know exactly how a lot of these journals work, but um, here's a, another very recent paper, which I think is fascinating. Um, you, this is, um, these authors looked at conference papers at a machine learning conference, and you're gonna see that certain words um, are, after 2023 suddenly got used much, much more commendable, meticulous, intricate. And so you see this in at the conference, they saw it in a, uh, but they aren't finding it in nature portfolio journals. And so this is evidence that, that they argue is that AI, chat GPT, people are using help to write their papers. And I, I think that brings up a whole new can of worms. Um, it's easier than ever to create phony or at least artificial academic text. I am optimistic, or I do think a bright side of AI is that it can help non-native English speakers, perhaps. I know some non-native English speakers use AI to help them with their writing, with their prose, which I think is totally fine. And anything we can do to facilitate or to break down barriers in that realm is great. But on the other hand, it's a big problem when students and now professors are using um, ChatGPT or some sort of AI program to write their papers for them. So I thought this was a very clever way of showing, yes, people are definitely using AI in order to write their articles because we're seeing a lot of intricate, versatile, meticulous, all these words suddenly just shot up in frequency. So um, I, I included a citation below. I think that's a really cool paper. And once again, another really neat way to get at, you know, academic integrity in publishing. Now, some of you might be familiar with Data Collada. Um, there are three, I think, psychology professors who work on doing this kind of stuff, not necessarily as publishers, but they find problematic articles. And Data Collada has absolutely been in the press, uh, a hot issue in academ academia. Um, they exposed two very, very high status, very high profile professors um, as doing potentially fraudulent work. And uh, Francesca Gino, who I thought was just this incredible wunderkind, um, she, 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 it's, it could be up to a hundred grand to get her to talk to you for a day. Um, very famous Harvard Business School professor. And then you have Dan Ariely. I'm sure you're familiar with many of his popular books. Um, another very high status, very well-known professor who actually currently has a show on NBC 
based on his life, based on his work. And it got greenlit before all the scandals came out. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with this show, whether they turn the character kind of uh, unethical in the future, I'm not sure. But um, here's Nobel laureate Richard Thaler saying, I know he's been making that stuff up for years. And, um, but so anyways, the data collateral people, and I don't have time to, um, explain the methodological details in depth. If you're interested, go to the Data Collada website. Um, but once again, I'm bringing this up because they use methods of just detecting anomalies. Um, they're much more clever than, or they're, they're extremely clever and methodologically sophisticated sometimes. Um, but here they're showing, they were able to show that in this one study involving both Ariely, Ariely and Gino, that people had moved um, certain observations in the study to, support their hypothesis. Um, and may, this is just this was really mind blowing. They found an obscure Excel function called calc chain. And I had no idea. I don't think most of us knew Excel could do this sort of thing. They could go back to see what happened to a spreadsheet 10 years ago, if it got saved repeatedly and repeatedly, and they could go back in time almost and see exactly how it was manipulated. And so they could figure out somebody manipulated this, um, this Excel spreadsheet in a way to, to make the results statistically significant in the direction they wanted. Um, you see other, and okay, so that's quite complicated and ingenious, but then they also, this is also much simpler, but also clever. Um, they looked at the, the Ariely and Gino study was about people reporting mileage driving rental cars and half the data looked legitimate and then half of it looked potentially artificial. And when people report things in their life, we generally round to like, you know, how much did you drive? You know, you say 300 kilometers or 400 kilometers generally. People tend not to say 412, 438 or whatever, or at least they're less likely to. So in one part of the data, you see the last digit of the reported mileage was overwhelmingly zero on the left. So um, whereas on the right, each number is equally likely to be the last digit. So once again, you see this difference. And I argue the chart on the right is not really indicative of how people generally report things in their lives. People are more likely to round to the nearest zero, sometimes the nearest five, but this is also a red flag. And this is just looking at the last digits of the data. And now we're getting to a really simple thing that turned out to be a red flag. Somebody else noticed that, um, and that, once again, this is like 10 point font, so it wasn't totally obvious. Um, somebody noticed that the the data set, some of the observations were in Calibri font and some of the observations were in Cambria font. Um, so I put the two fonts up there on the left. And once again, this is a very, very simple thing. You don't need to be a genius to notice this, but it ended up being a pretty profound revelation and a pretty profound red flag that, okay, I think it was the Cambria side that was almost certainly artificially created. Um, so... Once again, I mean, I bring up the data collada case with Ariel and Ariely and Gino just because it's just more ways. There's a lot of different ways, either using calc chain or just looking at noticing different fonts. There's all sorts of different ways to notice anomalies. Things are suspicious. And a few days ago, this um, I, this woman Leslie McIntosh mentioned the notion of the emerging field of forensic science metrics and. I guess, you know, at least in North America, crime shows are, are often very popular. And it's kind of fun to think of yourself as a detective, but that's kind of what a lot of these fraudulent articles, publishers, journals put people in. They have to get to the point where, okay, we're looking for clues. We're looking for anomalies. You know, one little thing that's off ends up, you know, showing, ends up leading to like a huge revelation of malfeasance, of publishing fraud. Um, and another, I should have put her in the presentation. Some of you might be familiar with Elizabeth Bick. Um, she's a Dutch woman who has been, who has this incredible talent for seeing where images have been manipulated. And so she has this giant monitor and she just stares at pictures in biology and she can tell which ones have been manipulated or not. Um, Cause that's another thing that happens through Photoshop or I'm not sure exactly how people do it. You can manipulate images and we have this one kind of uh, good Samaritan, the sleuth with an amazing talent that that's is somehow finding these biology papers that have been very, very, very subtly Photoshopped. So 
there's all sorts of different you know types of detectives and forensic ways to notice things that are wrong with articles or at least that might point to bigger problems so i think the near future we're all going to have to be detectives to some extent so that for future issues and i think chat gpt ai fraud and even when you have um you know ai drawing diagrams of freakish rats um Fraudulent academic material is easier to generate than ever. And, you know, one of the great things about online publishing about open access is that it's really lower barriers to entry. In theory, more and more people can participate in the publishing process. You don't need access to a printing press and to send reams of paper around the world. But on the other hand, that's also opened the door to a lot of bad actors and a lot of bad institutions. So these low barriers to entry, they're great but they also create problems. In our research, we found that Omics spun off lots and lots of new academic brands. So people are publishing with Omics and perhaps not knowing it. Um, once you, know, you have a journal, it loses its reputation, fine, rebrand it, call it something else and start from, start from fresh because having no reputation is better than having a bad reputation. Um, a lot of people say, okay, it's some of these Fraudulent articles are seldom cited, and that's true. Um, some of them are cited, though. But regardless, even if they aren't cited, they're used by scientists, by academics in their hiring, tenure, and promotion structures. Um, we need new techniques. And I thought that that Stanford paper that showed certain words suddenly being used much more often, we need new techniques to identify fraudulent or recycled texts. Can we generate new ways to look at fraudulent images. And then who will re police research integrity? I mean, I mentioned um, Elizabeth Bick. Um, her work is unpaid. She has a GoFundMe to help her work. It's an often thankless and difficult job. And I'll circle back to Data Collada. Some of you may be familiar. Um, one of the scientists that they exposed or whose work they were very critical of, she has sued them for, I think it was $3 million or an extremely high amount of money. And they're going to be put through this you know, long legal process, even if this lawsuit is vexatious. So it's been, I can tell it's been stressful for them, even if they are in the right. Um, so it's an often thankless and difficult job to be policing research integrity. There doesn't seem to be professional rewards. Um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Beck on Twitter the other day just said, there's no grants for this. So it's an often thankless and difficult job. And I'd argue perhaps an important one. Publishers have resources. Will they invest in fraud detection? And perhaps that might be a way publishers signal or foster quality in the future. They're able to keep the obviously fraudulent articles out um, more often than less selective publishers. Um, and then open science is a potential remedy for this. And in our in the paper I got invited to talk about today, and in, in our own research. Um, we suggest um, to starve the Hydra. Now, some of you may be familiar with the creature, the Hydra. Um, it's a monster with many heads. You cut off one head, but then it just grows two more. And we use this metaphor based on an Indian scientist that was kind of exacerbate, exasperated with the amount of pu predatory publishing going on in India. And he said, this is just like a Hydra. We cut off one head and then two or three more grows. So this... What we ended up arguing is, okay, we can't be cutting off heads of the Hydra. We have to starve the Hydra. And that means denying these predatory publishers money and manuscripts. And one way to do so would be demanding open peer review. Um, if you are a legitimate journal, then you should be able to prove that at least you've made some sort of good faith effort to vet the article, to give it gatekeeping and gestational benefits. Um, now, a caveat there, there might be some unscrupulous publishers and then try to AI their open peer review, but once again, it's easier to catch them that way. Um, universities, I think, have the rights to vet publishers for subscription and APC fees. We're paying, like, I think through Project Deal in Germany. Um, regardless, academic publishing is a billion-dollar industry. There is no reason why the institutions that fund this industry shouldn't demand some sort of accountability for their for the investments they make. And then one thing we hope will happen with our database is that, okay, we can identify and follow up with people who publish in questionable journals. 
I know um, I found an example of CUNY, the, the City University of New York was trying to do this with their university because some scholars are honestly naive and they try, they put a good piece of work into a really bad journal, but others are blatantly malfeasant. And I think open access is new to a lot of people and it can be an educational opportunity um, because, you know, even if it's not harmful to that one particular scholar, what you're doing is you're helping fund it and legitimate these predatory publishers that do have an outsized disproportional impact on science in the developing world, um, in lower status institutions, and you're just keeping this metaphorical monsters alive. So I'll close by saying we have to, through a variety of means, changing the incentives, changing surveillance, we need to stop the flow of money and manuscripts to bad faith journals, to unprofessional journals, and not by blacklisting, not by, you know, cutting off heads of the hydra repeatedly. We have to starve the hydra. So I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you very much for having me. I hope I was reasonably on time. And I look forward to opening the floor to any questions. And I will stop sharing the PowerPoint.